The year is 135 BC and Rome dominates the Mediterranean following its defeat of Carthage in the Punic Wars. Yet Rome was not so mighty that it was above fear. This new terror having a defiant face in Eunice, the slave who became a king. The irresistible rise of the Roman Republic during the Punic Wars saw the subjugation of Sicily around 210 BC. This region had historically been a culturally mixed island of Greek, Punic and then Roman influence. Yet by the year of the First Servile War, Sicily was firmly ensconced within the Roman sphere. Rome's full conquest of the island saw drastic changes to land ownership, with Roman land speculators streaming across to buy up large estates formerly held by the Carthaginians or simply acquiring large tracts of land at rock-bottom prices. Roman victories in the past centuries had also had a negative impact on demographic and land patterns, most drastically seen in Sicily. Each enemy state vanquished saw vast amounts of slaves captured and sold to Roman masters, the riches and loot taken also gorging the equites and senatorial elites, funding the emergence of latifundia or huge plantations. These plantations produced huge amounts of grain to be exported north back to Rome, the urban areas of the growing empire swelling too with the influx of free, yet landless plebeians deprived of their lands. City populations grew the more the speculators brought up smaller land holdings throughout Italy, creating a reliance on grain imports. Sicily was thus an important province, but one frequently overlooked, given it was good for grain imports and not much else. This provided considerable leeway for governors of the province to act as harshly as they wished, and often just to prop up the interests of the slave-owning elite there. Diodorus Siculus notes that conditions for Sicilian slaves were particularly harsh. The Roman conquest of Macedonia and Carthage provided a huge swathe of slaves, as well as the slave trade conducted by the pirates of the Mediterranean, making servile life very cheap. Masters could thus afford to cheerfully work their slaves from dawn to dusk in the fields, chained at the ankles and locked away in little more than pits at night. Since dead slaves could be cheaply replaced, feeding them was also of little concern, with masters allowing petty theft and banditry for their survival. Ironically then, in a particularly fertile part of the Roman world, vast swathes of people lived in near starvation and misery. Since most slaves were field hands, not a particularly skillful occupation, their chances of freedom were extremely low in contrast to slaves which provided a particular skill or had some other bond to their master. Slaves who resorted to banditry, the pastores, were herders and often armed with the consent of their masters. This created a perfect class of armed and arguably experienced, yet still discontented, unfree men. Pastores of different masters were often pitted against one another, thus gaining experience of skirmishing, their crimes regularly covered up by their masters. While this class of unfree military power developed unchecked, in contrast, the mass buying up of land in the region also had the obvious opposite effect, reducing the number of armed free men in the countryside. The small free militia groups that did exist were also not of the highest quality given the political and economic context of the time. Since Rome dominated the island, they had no real incentive to train hard, faced no obvious threats. This toxic brew thus created ideal conditions for the revolts that would come, a ready-made class of armed and experienced slave troops that would rally around the right leader. That leader would emerge in the charismatic figure of Eunice in 135 BC. Eunice was seemingly one of those exceptional slaves that did endear themselves to their masters. Eunice began life as a Syrian from Apamea, but was enslaved to a Greek man of the city of Enna, named Demophilus. Demophilus and his wife, Megalus, were said to be notably cruel in an era and place of high cruelty already. Eunice, however, was known for his visions, and thus enjoyed a privileged, if humiliating place at his master's side, with Demophilus parading him before guests as little more than a fool to divine their fortunes and even entertaining them with sleight of hand tricks, singing, fire-breathing acts, fire also notably spouting forth from his mouth as he entered into his prophetic trances, 
To some though, this eccentric slave was rather more than a mere fool. Amidst the laughter of elite onlookers, he prophesied that the slaves would rise up and take the city of Enna itself, while he, Eunice, would rise from a slave to become a king. It's likely Demophilus shared in the amusement of his guests at these proclamations. These other slaves though, weren't laughing. Various slaves plotted to murder their cruel master and mistress, though the scheme quickly grew to a far broader conspiracy to rise up generally as word spread beyond Demophilus's own plantation. The conspiracy grew up around Eunice, who gave gravitas to the Enterprise for his prophetic and holy demeanour. Believing their rising to be backed by the gods, around 400 slaves rose up in Enna, seizing the city with Eunice in their midst. It was said that Eunice himself stood in the front ranks, breathing fire from his lips as the slaves overrun the place to the likely terror of the slave-owning elite. Masters and their wives were hunted down mercilessly, with impromptu courts condemning them to torture and death. Those few who could forge weapons were spared, though they were forced into a grim inversion of their previous role to work in chains to provide weapons for their new masters. Ironically too, Eunice may have spared some of his former aristocratic audience, the men and women who had roared with laughter at his claims of future revolt and kingship, though only if they had tipped him well at the time. Eunice was firmly set as the leader of the revolt and quickly fulfilled his own prophecy by declaring himself king, taking the name Antiochus. This was the name of Seleucid kings from his native land, and likely a deliberate severing of his new free person from his former enslaved past, hearkening back to his own free origins. The initial 400 slaves that took Enna rose to around 6,000, though the final numbers are wildly contested, with estimates ranging from the tens of thousands to even 200,000. Eunice's army was likely not some green, unbloodied mass though, with many pastores or bandit slaves already having experience fighting, perhaps being armed and capable of training the actual raw recruits. Eunice initially sent these men outward to scour the countryside around Enna. These initial actions led to a lukewarm response from the Roman authorities, the small forces sent to deal with them, overwhelmed by the sheer numbers and likely experience of the slaves. Shortly after the storming of Enna in 135, the prospects of the Eunician revolt were strengthened by another rising in the southern city of Agrigentum. This separate action was led by a certain Cleon, a man made in a different mould to Eunice. Cleon was a Sicilian slave from the area of modern Anatolia, Turkey, who had a reputation as an infamous brigand and fighter. Having established himself in the south, the Romans may have hoped that these two slave leaders would inevitably turn on each other, doing much of the killing work themselves. Yet if they did hope this, they were dead wrong. Though clearly the more skilled general, Cleon also had the wisdom to put aside any of his own pretensions to lordship, and even acknowledged Eunice's claim to kingship. Thus instead of using his own 5,000 or so strong army to vanquish a rival, he moved north to join the newly minted King Antiochus and acted as his general. The first test would come at the hands of Roman praetor Lucius Hypsaeus. That the authorities sent a praetor at all indicates a growing concern for the revolt, but the response proved unequal to the real threat. Lucius's 8,000 or so Sicilian militia were routed. After the defeat of a praetor, the revolt spread further still, Eunice's slave army controlling the majority of the island, as well as defeating three other praetors in succession. Over a brief period of some three years, Eunice thus ruled as a king in deed as well as name, clearly moving to establish an independent kingdom under his own rule. He minted his own coins, had officials and a queen, as well as the acknowledgement of his followers, not least among them his enforcer Cleon. In 134 BC, the Senate finally began to wake up to the seriousness of the situation, sending a consul, Flaccus, to crush the slaves. While details of this campaign are nearly non-existent, we do know, given subsequent events, that it was inconclusive. In 133 BC, Lucius Calpurnius Piso met with more concrete success. The Roman army recaptured Morgantina, and setting a grisly example by crucifying all the slaves they captured, with 8,000 more already falling to their swords. 
Piso also attempted to take the city of Tauromenium in the northeast, but was beaten back, leaving the task to another consul. Publius Rapilius blockaded the city, reducing the slaves within to starvation, and even, it was said, to cannibalism. Unable to endure this further, a slave named Serapion betrayed its defenders. The Roman assault on Tauromenium was brutal and merciless, with the weakened men within putting up an anemic defence. After their defeat, Rapilius commanded that all those slaves taken be tortured and then rounded up, cast to their deaths from a cliff. Following this, the consul went for the jugular. Enna had been where the revolt had begun and remained the hub of the rebellion. Cleon himself was based there and now Rapilius went to strike the head off the snake. Cleon would not sit back submissively as the hated foes starved them to racks. Cleon remained a fighter to the end, preferring to sally out and meet Rapilius head on. This proved a brave, if forlorn, final act, as Cleon was eventually felled, with his mangled corpse hoisted aloft for all the remaining defenders to see. This was enough to break them completely, inducing another betrayal and the fall of Enna. With the fall of Cleon and the de facto capital of Enna, Eunice's dream of a kingdom of freed men was finally doomed. Eunice did not fight at the siege of Enna himself, and initially avoided capture, fleeing with a few followers, though he was eventually cornered in a pit with a few devoted men taken to the city of Morgantina. It was likely that his Roman masters wanted to make a particularly gruesome example of the slave who pretended to kingship, and a fate of public torture and execution awaited. This, however, was not to be Eunice's fate, as he died shortly after of disease, perhaps a small victory of fortune in robbing his foes of a final agonising humiliation. Rapilius remained in Sicily into 131 BC, stamping out the final embers of revolt, though with the principal leaders dead, the result was already a fait accompli. Rapilius earned a triumph for his successes, Rapilius did institute some kind of settlement after the fighting died down, known as the Lex Rapilia, though this changed very little about the underlying conditions that caused the war to begin with. Rapilius seems to have fixated on the Syrian origins of some of the slaves, notably Eunice, and decided settlement of different slaves with different cultures and languages would be enough to solve the problem. Rapilius, as well as other Roman commanders, would merely perpetuate the initial underlying conditions of the first revolt by restocking the plantations with new slaves from captured people on other fronts to replace the dead the last three years. Thus new groups of culturally similar slaves replaced the old, having linguistic and cultural connections that fostered strong bonds of fellowship. The Roman authorities and plantation owners thus erroneously deduced that given the numbers of slaves recently killed and the brutal punishments inflicted, that no further insurrections would come. Yet few slaves likely lived to recount such horrors to the new batches being imported in, thus setting the stage for another major revolt just a few years later. The first servile revolt may not be as well known as the much more famous third, led by Spartacus, but it is interesting in its aims and the figure of Eunice. The second servile revolt under the leadership of Salvius and Athenion, was partially inspired by Eunice. Salvius too would proclaim himself a king and would similarly take a Seleucid royal name in Trifon. Eunice's actual martial prowess or participation in the war is largely non-existent from what we can tell and all the sources give credit for the slave military successes to Cleon. However, far from diminishing the character of the slave king, this actually enhances it. Eunice must have been a man of considerable political talent and charisma to hold together his army and followers, as well as command the loyalty of Cleon himself. That Eunice was able to quickly mould his reputation as a religious figure into a more concrete political mandate is also impressive. Eunice is remarkable in and of himself in his rising so quickly from a slave to a king, and deserves his place as an iconic symbol of resistance against overwhelming power and injustice.